starts a life sentence today for the murder of Rachel Manning in Milton Keynes. Today I'm going to look at the case of Rachel Manning who was clobbered to death by Shahidul Ahmed. If you do end up liking this video, please subscribe. In December of 2002, Rachel Manning left a nightclub in Milton Keynes to catch a taxi home. On the 11th of December, Rachel was found dead. She was buried by a golf course in Bedfordshire. Rachel's boyfriend, Barry White, who was aged 20 at the time, was tried and sent to prison for her murder. It wasn't until 2008 that Barry was acquitted when new forensic evidence was found. On Tuesday the 11th of December in 2000, a greenkeeper is shocked to discover the body of a young woman by a golf course. The victim, 19 year old Rachel Manning, had been murdered, beaten repeatedly and almost unrecognizable with a steering lock. Within minutes, police would arrive on the scene. What would become a complex 12 year investigation was about to begin. On the evening of Saturday, December the 9th, in the year 2000, Barry and Rachel went with some of their friends to a 70s themed party. Rachel and Barry were captured on some amateur video footage taken that night. Rachel was wearing this distinctive blue wig. Barry was in these white flared trousers. And it was a party for the night, so they both decided to go. Dancing away, drinking, they decided to move on to another place called Chicago. As they left the nightclub, after a few more drinks around 1.30 a.m., Barry gets into an argument. He goes over to a kebab stall and he is surrounded by an unpleasant group of men. A man who is a warehouse worker for a local supermarket and in the community is known to have a reputation, decided to pick on Barry. This man suggested that Barry spilled some of his salad on his shoe. The man took offense and ended up getting angry. One of his friends threw a punch at Barry on the side of the face. Rachel steps in and tried to calm it down, which she did. Then the police came and Barry and Rachel walked away. The both of them then stopped to have a little chat. Rachel was trying to get him to go back to the club and keep queuing for a taxi to go home. But Barry did not want to have anything to do with that. Barry just got into a scuffle and did not want to go back to the club. Barry just wanted to go home as he had work the next morning. So Barry makes his way towards his friend's house. He gets there in the early hours and his friend Keith is asleep on the couch. Then, unexpectedly, the phone rang. It was Rachel. Slowly, Barry started to lose his temper. Rachel confirmed she is lost and she does not know where she is. So Barry advised Rachel to go to a local Blockbusters where Keith and Barry would pick her up. When Barry and Keith showed at the Blockbusters, unfortunately, Rachel was not there. Barry and Keith continue to drive around looking for Rachel. They go back at least twice, if not three times to the blockbusters, but she's still not there. Barry leaves Keith in his car and walks around the block. There are pictures from CCTV footage showing Barry walking around the various roads looking for her. For everyone connected with Rachel, the nightmare was only beginning. If we go back to the greenkeeper, he said he saw something. On December 11th, he said he saw what looked like a white boot and he approached it. And as he got closer, he immediately realized that there was a dead body of a woman and he called the police. Keith, meanwhile, immediately found himself at the center of the police inquiry. And on that particular morning, Keith had to drive near the golf course. He decided to call Sharon, Barry's mother. 
He said, there's a lot of police attention by the golf course. It might be something to do with Rachel. Do you think I should stop and ask the police? So he went to the police officer and he asked what is happening, what is going on. And he told the police officer that his friend's girlfriend had gone missing a couple of days before and people were worried about her. So he asked if a body had been found. It was him doing that which then put him into the spotlight with the police because the police interpreted that as classic behavior of a killer or someone involved with a murder coming back to the scene to see what's going on. It was this moment where Keith implicated him and Barry. Rachel was struck around 17 times, most of her teeth were broken, her jaw was broken, it was a frenzied and brutal attack. She received a number of nasty injuries to her face, around the eye socket, the cheek, the head and there's a suggestion being whoever had done it tried to mask her identity by causing injuries that would disfigure her face. In most cases, police look at those closest to the victim as suspects. So the police moved to arrest Barry and Keith. Barry and Keith's lives became the subject of an intensive police operation over the next two months. Both were subjected to interviews. In total, three separate days of interviews. The first were in December, then in January and then in February. The trial of Barry White and Keith Hyatt began in July 2001. The prosecution centered their case on the assertion that Barry killed Rachel and Keith helped him dispose of her body. The initial premise was that they had a specific motive for committing the crime. The suggestion from the prosecution was that Barry and Keith were in a homosexual relationship and that is why they needed to rid Rachel. The primary evidence centered around particles of lighter flint. It was alleged that this was found on Rachel's clothes. This was evidence presented by Professor Kenneth Pye, a forensic geologist working for the prosecution. Without Professor Pye, the case against Barry and Keith would never have gone to court. It was the pivotal piece of evidence. They said that there were these minuscule particles that you wouldn't be able to see with the naked eye that were on the victim's skirt and they were also on the van seat from Keith's van. And the expert said that finding those particles in both those locations on the victim's gut meant that she had to be in that van very soon before her body was left at the wood. And it was that bit of evidence that got the case to court. Barry White and Keith Hyatt in 2002 both were jailed for their part in the murder. The matter of Rachel's murder eventually came to the attention of a BBC television programme. They did everything they could to possibly clear their names. Barry and Keith first submitted themselves to DNA testing. They also found under controlled experiments that you could get thousands of particles for every flick of a lighter. They also could travel around two meters. One concern that Keith always had was that he had a dog and his dog was in the van all the time. And not once when samples were taken from the van was there any recollection of dog hair. There was a huge amount of CCTV that night. So the defense team drilled down how much time and opportunity you would have to have to commit this crime. They felt it was a minuscule amount of time. The defense argued that they had to, in that time, travel a couple of miles to the golf course, deposit the body, up a muddy slope, and it was at night so there was no lights. And when they dumped the body, they would have to get back in the van and then drive back. And if you look at the time frame this would take, and then the CCTV images of Barry walking around and seeing their van driving around, it did not correlate. And when it came to the steering lock, which had been instrumental in Rachel's death, there was no DNA match between Barry, Keith and what was on the steering lock. The steering lock didn't match any DNA in the police database. So the defense team believed the findings were inconclusive. The forensics was inconclusive. The CCTV was telling and the DNA was beyond question. In 2005, Keith Hyatt was released on parole and in 2007, Barry White was acquitted. Trial then, you were by this stage, well known around Milton Keynes as Barry yep. White, the man charged with Rachel's murder. Yep. Rachel's family who, you know, you knew 
from yeah. going out with Rachel, yeah. having to face them in court every day. Can you put into words what that was like? I, it was. That was just. I couldn't believe they believed it was me. Right, because of what the police were telling them, I just could not believe that anyone thought it was me. And yeah, it was. It was no. It wasn't nice them looking at you like, like you actually, you, you're the murderer of their girl, like their daughter. It was. It was. It was horrible. You were saying that you never, never come in like, they actually judge me like I'm the actual person who done this, and I didn't, and that was hard. That was very hard. Did you feel that you wanted to speak to them and see? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to say like, look, this weren't me. Uh, I loved your daughter to bits. So this weren't me. But what with what the police were turning them, they didn't want to speak to me. I wouldn't want to speak to the person who was accused of doing what I, what I got accused of doing. Oh, and if, if, if it was there, I, I'd never talk to the person again, ever. And Barry White joins us now. Good morning to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, the real victims in all this, of course, Rachel Manning and her family. Uh, but my goodness me, you've had to suffer as well. I can't begin to imagine what it's like being in jail, an innocent man. How, how do you cope? Oh, it, was, it was devastating. It was horrible. It was one of the worst things that could ever happen to me. I didn't know what to do, what was happening. And to be accused of killing my girlfriend. And yeah. Because the thing about it was, not only are you finding yourself in jail, you didn't do it, but you're mourning. You mm, know, you, the I loss didn't get of time your girlfriend. They what, just arrested me straight away and built the case around me, not built the case and then put me in the middle. It was like, you did this and we're going to put you in jail. Uh, how low did you get in jail? Uh, low. I turned to drugs and, and I just couldn't cope with it for, at the beginning. I thought about suicide and just thought, I ain't going to do 16 years. I'm not going to be able to handle this. And then I, was a, I had the Rough Justice, that was a, the light in all this. The Rough Justice said uh, that was the, the, mm. the TV programme, obviously, yeah. the, the campaigning programme, an amazing Yeah, program. absolutely amazing. Overturned some terrible miscarriages of justice, mm. including, including yours. If not for them, do you think you would still be there? Uh, I reckon I'd have got out, but I reckon it would have taken a lot longer. Taken a lot longer? Yeah. So how do you then pick up your life after this? You know, how do you manage to do that? Great difficulty. I've yeah, struggled yeah. and can't find work. I've been on medication for stress and depression. But I've got a good family and friends behind me who've supported me and helped me out for all of this. Because so. you did get married, didn't you? But that, yes, that relationship, I got married, yeah. That relationship fell apart. Yeah. But you've got a little girl. Yeah, I've got a little I mean, girl. that's a light, isn't it? Yeah. You've got there. And what about now? I mean, is there someone in your life? Yeah, I've got my girlfriend, Lee. She's, she's been amazing. She's an absolutely amazing girl. Good. Now, now you're a father, you must also uh, know exactly what Rachel's parents have had yeah, to go Yeah, I couldn't through. imagine losing my daughter could not imagine it. It must be one of the worst feelings in the world. Uh, Especially to lose a daughter like the way they lost theirs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they say they, uh, they, they can't forget uh, your behaviour on the night uh, she died. Um, do you wish you'd, you'd acted differently? Oh, yeah, if we'd have known all this would have happened, then I'd have mm. took her with me. She'd have come with me. If, but I'm sure you've you can't live on what ifs, can your you? mind all the time. You've all got the time, yourself, yeah. If only you hadn't got... Yeah, no one beat themselves up as much as I have about leaving her that night. I mean, it's difficult, very, very difficult. Have you spoken to her, her family at all? No, no, none. Uh, and has it helped in a way that the real killer is now is now behind bars? Yes, that's, uh, I'm glad he's behind bars. I'm, I'm glad justice has been done for her family and for Rachel. Yeah. And, and as we said, you're just trying to sort of rebuild your life now. Yeah. Have you, or is there any indication that you will get compensation for all the years? That well, we're fighting for compensation now. We, right. I'm a solicitor's on it now in a minute. But we've been fighting for five years. Sure. And if, if Rachel's parents were here, is there anything you'd want to say to them? I'm just happy that they've got justice. I'm so happy that they've got justice for their daughter. And what happened to Rachel still remained unsolved. Forensic science was about to take the investigation in an entirely new direction. CCTV fibre analysis and DNA profiling had proved who hadn't killed Rachel. This case was now more open than ever. And the key piece of evidence was on the murder weapon, the steering lock, which contained DNA. In May, during the year of 2010, a woman, on a night out, approached a car believed to be a taxi. The driver was, in fact, an opportunistic sexual predator. And unknown to the woman, she was in danger. She gets into the car, and at some point, very shortly after that, he tries to attack her. She manages to free herself, she gets out of the car and tries to run away. This is witnessed 
by a passerby who can see that this young woman is in trouble. She escapes after being indecently assaulted and even though the woman didn't want to call the police, she takes the registration plate of his car and that decision would prove absolutely pivotal. The car's registration led them to a man whom the police knew nothing about. Now a DNA sample from the crime scene didn't match anything against the police database. However, as Mr. Ahmed was arrested, he was now officially in the database and a match was found. Shahidul Ahmed is a UK citizen who lived in Bletchley, about eight miles south of Milton Keynes. Mr. Ahmed was a restaurant worker, a chef, and he was of Asian descent. He was married and had five children. He was arrested on suspicion of Rachel Manning's murder in September 2010. The court heard how Ahmed had picked up Rachel on the night she went missing in the pretense of being a taxi driver sometime in the early hours. He assaulted her before dragging her to the golf course. He strangled her before battering her on the head with the steering lock. The court also heard how two specific pieces of forensic evidence proved Ahmed's association with the crime a strand of his hair found in Rachel's clothes and the DNA found on the steering lock. Mr. Ahmed was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 17 years. You. Uh, first of all, Keith, if I could turn to you, um, a miscarriage of justice uh, uh, on extraordinary scale. I just wonder if you could give us a, a little insight into what it was like for you in those years when you were jailed, you knew you were innocent, um, and the years were passing and nothing was happening? Uh, quite frightening really because um, you went in there having this belief in the, the British justice um, and I think we were both waiting for the, someone to come along, unlock the door and say, sorry, it's, <clears throat> it's all been a mistake, um, you can go home now. But that didn't happen and we learned to our cost that the British justice isn't quite what we thought it was. Yeah, and Keith, just to give us a sense, I mean, people have an impression that in a, in a jail, a lot of people are saying, I didn't do it. Uh, how, how did people react to your uh, always saying that I'm innocent, that, that I didn't do this? How did people react? Um, well, it does upset some of the, uh, you know, the prisons inside, but most of them uh, were pretty good. And, and after a while, the, the staff, they, they themselves, start believing you, particularly when the BBC Rough Justice got involved um, with our case. OK, Keith, we'll come back to you in a minute, um, if we can. Louise, so you took up the case, as it were. Um, just kind of outline what, what, you, you know, what happened and how you got to this conclusion. It's a long story, I know, but let's start a little it bit is, in the beginning. It is. It's 11 years our, was, was our involvement in the case. Yeah. Keith's family wrote to us pretty much as soon as he, he was convicted and asked Rough Justice to take a look at his case. So I went off and met the both, both men's families, sat with them for an afternoon and, and went through and got a picture of what they were like. And we then really just tried to unpick the evidence to look at the oval scenario that had been put forward and to see whether it stacked up, whether or not this seemed likely. We then set about checking wherever we could anything which could be independently verified against what they said had happened that night, we checked that. Mm. So we checked CCTV and when they said they were out looking for Rachel, there they were on CCTV looking for her. And one of the key things was the, was the sort of timings involved, wasn't it? It was, absolutely. We broke it all down uh, so that we could really plot where they were because of the amount of cameras around Milton Keynes and the amount of phone calls that, that Barry had made. We could, we could work out where he was at various times and we mm. found that there was actually only a very small window of about 20 minutes where they could have been killing her and disposing of the body. So right from the start, that set off enormous alarm bells, as in how likely is this? Are these guys really... You know, these, these sort of super master criminals that have plotted this and managed to get away with this. So then we looked from there at the forensic evidence, which have really put them in the dock, mm. which came down to particle evidence, which was on the, the, the victim's skirt, which was also in Keith's van, which an expert said was so unusual, it meant she had to have been in the van before she was killed. And once we started looking at that evidence, we found that that was based entirely on assumptions. Those assumptions hadn't been tested. And once we had them tested, the evidence crumbled and it all fell away. Mm. And Keith, uh, the, the police, the detectives involved have apologised, I know, for what happened. W what are your reflections now, uh, knowing what you know about what they didn't do and the evidence they didn't uncover? Um, 
Well, since, since that time, I mean, obviously the police officers have changed. I mean, the ones involved in this, this uh, particular uh, trial have been, I would say, excellent. And I, I, I admired their courage to come forward and apologise to us, because that's quite rare these days. And Keith, I mean, it would be, you know, it must have had a very, very serious impact on your life, what happened to you, and the fact that you spent these years in jail. Well, it did. I mean, one, you're away from your, your family, um, and my father during the time wasn't, was not well. Um, so it was quite annoying just not being able to get out and being, being able to help, being there for them at a time when they needed it. Uh, Louise, I know that you don't, you don't rough justice. You don't do rough justice anymore. It was axed by the BBC, sadly, in yeah. 2007. I want to now show you a press conference which was held by Rachel's parents. We believe Rachel would still be with us today if she had not been by, abandoned by her boyfriend the night she was attacked, killed, and brutally battered. It seems Rachel's parents were not fond of Barry in the first place. Either way, my conclusion on this story. This is a case of police negligence. But I always feel there's someone that is missing out during a crime story. For example, the police got their conviction. Regardless of how they got there, they got there. That's a win for them. Barry and Keith are free. That's a win for them. What about the parents of Rachel? Did they get to question Mr. Ahmed? Did they get to speak to him so he can provide closure? As I mentioned, while the police and the suspects are now living in relief, the parents are still in despair. Maybe it's a crumb of comfort to know eventually what happened for the parents, but no parent should ever have to witness their children dying. Justice may have been served, but for the parents, this fixed nothing. Thanks for watching.